But I want to welcome everyone to this um, uh, EU Gemrite 2 Work Package 9 webinar and update meeting. Uh, so today I will be running the meeting, but uh, the co-leads, Christine, uh, and I think Signe Ut and Johan will also be here uh, to take part in discussions as well. So before we start with uh, the very interesting presentations from our guests today, uh, I just wanted to show you the agenda for the whole meeting. So first we have the webinar part of the meeting where we have two very interesting presentations ahead of us. First, we will hear from Adrian van den Hoven from Medicines for Europe and Boumedien Sophie and Priya Kudva from Sandoz. Uh, and they will talk about how companies forecast anticipated demand for human generic antibiotics, both in primary and secondary care. Then there will be room for some questions and discussions. Uh, and then our uh, second presentation uh, that, that we will hear from, where we will hear from Andreas Asamer and Javier Molin from Access VetMed Europe. And they will talk about how companies forecast anticipated demand for veterinary antibiotics, both in livestock and companion animals. And then we will have some room for questions and discussions as well. So that's the first part of this meeting, the, the webinar part. And then we will go into the, the second and last part of the meeting, which will be a Work Package 9 update and discussion. Uh, we will talk a little bit about the barrier analysis that you will be performing this fall, uh, including this document that Christine emailed uh, all of you yesterday, uh, the participants. We will have a short menti and discussion regarding our Work Package 9 teams, and then we want to follow up regarding suggestions for future Work Package 9 webinars. So that's today's agenda. Um, and I'm going to stop sharing here. Uh, and without, let me see if, if I can just get you all on the screen again. There you are. Yes, without further ado, we are very pleased to welcome our first speakers uh, for today. Adrian van den Hoven from Medicines for Europe and Boumedien Sophie and Priya Kudva from Sandoz. So, well, very welcome uh, to this Work Package 9 webinar, and the virtual floor is now yours. Thank you. Okay. Uh, really, thanks a lot for inviting us today. I'm going to put up uh, a slideshow. So, um, we've changed a little bit the order of the presentation today. So, actually, my colleagues from Sandoz Bo and Priya are going to start the presentation. So they are both from Sandoz, the company Sandoz, which is a, a leading antibiotic manufacturer in our membership. But in today's uh, presentation, they're actually speaking on behalf of Medicines for Europe, so of the wider uh, generic industry perspective. Um, and also Bo is uh, representing Medicines for Europe in the AMR expert group at the EU level. So just to clarify that point, of course, um, they know a lot about Sandoz as well, so you can also ask some questions about that if there's something specific there. So if everybody can see the presentation, I'm actually going to hand it over first to Bo. And Bo, just tell me and I'll move the slides forward, okay? Sure, thank you, Adrian. I don't see the slides. I don't know if it's just me. Oh, hmm. let me try again. I can't see them Sorry either, unfortunately. Let me try again. Apologies for that. Can you see the slides now? Yes. Yes, perfect. Okay, I apologize for that. So we'll go to the first very easy slide. <laughs> perfect, thank you very much. So first right. and foremost, let me just say it's, it's an honor and pleasure to be here. And hopefully we'll be able to, to shed some light in terms of the situation when it comes to antibiotic production and supply, some of the challenges that we face and, and you know some of the, the key solutions that we're working on as well. So. When we were thinking about how to start this off, I thought it would be nice to basically shed some light and some appreciation when we talk about the world of antibiotics, really, what does, what does that mean, uh, you know, and just how complex it is and how important they are. There's a reason why they're called the backbone of modern medicine. Now, if we focus on the left-hand side, um, what you're going to see, and I promise I'm not going to go line by line, but these are pretty much all the different antibiotics available on the market. It's over 100. And they're classified according to their major groups and mechanisms and mode of action. 
And so they're designed basically that we have a huge diverse repertoire to be able to ensure that we can treat our patients the best way possible. Okay. Now, a couple of things I want to say, if we keep focusing on the left-hand side, what we essentially see is that there's a lot of different antibiotics that have different modes of action. And so one very critical point that I would like to highlight very quickly, especially being the lead of the AMR program at Sandoz, is that obviously, depending on the mode of action, right, you have certain pathogens that have learned how to uh, circumvent, right, uh, that particular mode of action, essentially make the, the antibiotic um, not as effective, or unfortunately, in some cases, not as effective at all. And that's the, the phenomenon of antimicrobial resistance. So it's very important by, by highlighting this, that we have a large, diverse portfolio and repertoire to be able to serve our patients directly. Now, obviously, on the left-hand side is quite complicating. So if we move to that figure on the left-hand side, what the attempt was here, and if there's any physicians on the call, I apologize in advance, but it was essentially attempting to say, okay, can we simplify the message by saying, look, if we were to break down, you know, the, the whole treatment paradigm of antibiotics, simply where, you know, the location of infection is, what antibiotics are typically used, you know, to treat that particular infection? And of course, this is sort of an average, if I can say, uh, of guidelines and treatment guidelines, but you're seeing a couple themes pop out there. First and foremost, you know, you see a lot of the penicillins actually coming out. And of course, depending ultimately what antibiotic you, you use would depend number one on access, number two on availability, three on, you know, what the patient infection is and what the doctor uh, also thinks would be the best course forward. But also taking into account, you know, some antibiotics were used earlier on, developed resistance or not available, and then they have to switch. Now, in the context of uh, what's mostly used, um, regardless of what article you refer to, um, you're going to see that the penicillins, which are in the access group of antibiotics and the aware classification by WHO, are clearly the most used antibiotics still today and represent a very important um, uh, segment when it comes to combating infections. Um, and I'll give some statistics on this in a second. I just want to quickly say, many of you have probably heard, you know, broad spectrum and narrow spectrum antibiotics. I'd like to just state, you know, there's not one antibiotic that treats one infection. Okay, it's a spectrum. But what we can gather from this is clearly you have those antibiotics that are more targeted, right, to a specific infection. A, backed by diagnostics where the doctor knows it's that or has a high suspicion. And broad spectrum will cover more than one pathogen. Now, to put some numbers on this, there was a recent UK study I read where basically 50% of all prescriptions in the UK last year was a penicillin-based antibiotic there. Now, if we switch to supply, we see this huge diverse portfolio. Now, in the context of supply, obviously that adds a lot of complexity, right? And a lot of planning that we're gonna hear a lot about today. We have to remember, it's not just a molecule. We also have different stock keeping units, right? Different dosage forms, which are very important in the context of addressing different populations like pediatrics and geriatrics, for example. And so all of this comes to play when we, when we do our planning. And I'd like to pass it on um, to my colleague Priya, who's going to tell us a little bit about the complexities in the process of how we actually forecast demand. Sure. Uh, thanks, Bo. Am I audible okay? Perfect. Okay. Thank you again for inviting us, and we are happy to share some of our insights and 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 experience uh, in in the whole forecasting process uh, in our organizations. Um, so I want to just give a little bit of a flavor of how uh, the whole forecasting process entails at a global scale and a global complexity, but also with a lot of interaction with country uh, teams really trying to work through this into their markets. Um, so demand planning and forecasting for us is usually bottom up. So we, we try and receive input from countries who actually uh, are closer to what's happening in the market and can bring in a lot of insights to the whole global forecasting process. Uh, usually also just to just note, countries forecast, I mean, we have a 10 year forecast, which is very broad. We also have then a three year forecast, which is pretty uh, accurate, but still, uh, I mean, of course, not perfect. And then a one-year forecast, which has to be really precise because those are the kind of lead times we are working with. We start procuring our raw materials, et cetera, like, you know, the, the wires, the bottles, et cetera, right now for everything that's required next year, for example. So, so the whole process has to start well in advance. And uh, at the moment, we have visibility of what's, uh, what's quite uh, accurately needed for next year because that's 
you know, our, our clock has already started in terms of manufacturing and procurement for next year. Uh, also, to just give a, an idea of what really goes into a country demand forecast planning, this is usually an effort by cross-functional teams, which include medical, uh, commercial, supply chain, finance, etc., who sit together and review a lot of data points. It is a very data-driven exercise, uh, also statistical, also using AI. Uh, but there are different analogs we use uh, in countries to forecast uh, accurately, or at least to the point of of uh, of clarity of what what we really need and there are multiple analogs but let me just highlight a few key ones um, firstly in in countries we study hcp prescription patterns wherever data is readily available we try and analyze uh, what is being prescribed uh, in community in hospitals and critical care uh, the usage patterns, the trends of molecules, any therapy shift that we see or anything, you know, to understand the medical relevance and, and the patterns of usage of different antibiotics. Uh, we also in parallel use IQVIA or other external data points to, to really analyze the volumes uh, for the whole country in relation to different companies. So it gives us a sense of uh, how many generic options are available or whether there are some molecules where there are no generics where we have to be absolutely uh, careful or, or more, more uh, concerned about making it available. You know, So I think all these various data points go into the forecast. Uh, another key input is prediction of the next season. So there's a lot of AI and a lot of tools used to, to predict uh, what the season could look like to the nearest accuracy. And I know Bo can talk about hours on this, um, of course, for a different topic, but seasonality is a key factor for us, uh, especially for respiratory tract infections to, to really know what to, what to predict or forecast for. Um, and I can think of, I mean, again, just to highlight the important ones, a, a very big input for us is what uh, our local governments and local hospital authorities uh, indicate to us in terms of upcoming tenders, uh, upcoming contracts or hospital usage or any intel or information shared uh, about, you know, any expected surge in infections or any um, expected increase in volume or demand that, that could come up. So I think there's various factors that go into the local country demand planning. All of this is collated globally. You know, we are working with hundreds of countries. So we look at what the scenario looks like globally and then work with our manufacturing side. So right now we are already working on next year's supply planning with our manufacturing sites who, who actually go into a very massive supply scheduling uh, exercise which involves uh, you know several molecules thousands of SKUs or stock keeping units and hundreds of countries to really phase out and plan out the manufacturing schedule for all all the antibiotics that that we currently manage uh, and 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 I think, uh, you know, to the best efficiency, to the best uh, availability, also taking into account what is medically critical, what is uh, essential and what, of course, has come through in terms of phasing from countries on the forecast. Um, so I think the big question is, is it possible to change or make changes to the forecast in real time? I'm sure that's a key question. Well, I, I think it depends. Uh, so we try our best to be flexible and agile, but of course there are constraints because as I mentioned right now, we're already ordering raw material and supplies for the next year's manufacturing. Um, if we are, if we know today about an upcoming volume increase in June next year, it is possible to, to probably accommodate and, and make changes. But if we knew in March about a surge in June, it, it becomes very challenging because everything is already in momentum and already in the manufacturing cycle. So usually organizations have a frozen zone, which is usually six months or so. So the nearest next six months, it's very challenging to make sudden changes. Um, and the only way one can make those changes is if we make a trade off, which means, you know, one country gets more and another country then goes on a stock out. So these are some challenges which we deal with and are uh, never easy to make decisions on this in real time. Uh, so that's just to give a sense of the complexity and the scale of things, because we're dealing with so many SKUs in real time and uh, 
in reality, there are changes and, and uh, you know, uh, fluctuations in forecasts that, that we anticipate. Um, I can go on, but I'll, I'll pause here and hand back to Bo, and then we can come back on questions. So Bo, if you could uh, take it forward. Thank you very much, Priya. And building on what Priya just said, you know, we, we just learned about the general process and also the, the different interdependencies as well as the complexities. And, and this, this chart here, this illustration, I think nicely shows just what we talk about when we talk about the complexity. So as you heard from Priya, I mean, we're, we're essentially talking about a year to a year and a half um, for the whole process. And if you look at the bottom, right, you can see that clearly the majority of that is um, is uh, focused on, you know, the excipients as well as uh, acquiring the APIs. And when you look down end to end, uh, what I'd like to basically conclude from this is that, look, not, you don't just have one that's important. Essentially, every step is important there. And of course, uh, we just heard from Priya that, you know, this is why it's of utmost importance to ensure that all factors are considered when, we, when we're coming up with that bottom-up forecast on country level, because clearly, as you heard, there are some cases where there could be some adaptations and some changes based on signals coming in, in terms of what could be needed from demand, but the process is not just a single step. And every single step, whether you're talking about the bulk production or the API acquisition or the packaging, let's not also forget on the packaging side of things, we're talking about multiple languages, multiple different pack sizes, and you know, multiple different primary and secondary packaging, all adds to the complexity. And that's why it's super important that those forecasts are as accurate as possible. Now, we, we know forecasts means um, you know, it's it's an estimation, but when it comes especially to antibiotics, it's, it's important that we make that as accurate as possible there. Now, just to give an extra level of appreciation before I pass to, to my colleague Adrian, this breaks down essentially to 350 different components there, right? Each is interdependent on the other. And you can see the majority of that, if you look at each dot here represented on the left-hand side, it's focusing on the packaging, the raw materials, the API. So as we heard from Priya, any delay or any surge in demand, for example, coming from secondary opportunistic bacterial infections, will create an impact on the supply chain delivery, not only from a delivery point of view of the products, but also delivery time. So making sure that we have every step covered and to the best of our knowledge work closely in a multi-stakeholder and collaborative environment is absolutely key to ensure that our patients get what they need. Now, very, very quickly, if we have to take away some, some key points here, Obviously, it's complex and high risk, but if we have to break it down into some themes, I'd just like to quickly cover a few. So obviously, look, uh, generics is clearly what's, you know, the majority of what's used on the market today. It has become essential to democratize and ensure our patients have access to what's needed. So you can imagine from a manufacturing point of view, there is no idle capacity. Generics industries and manufacturers essentially plan in such a way to ensure from the entire product mix of portfolio that it's maximizing its capacity, right, to ensure that we can produce what is needed where it's needed, and therefore also adds to this uh, message that we're bringing through of in terms of, you know, perhaps some constraints when it comes to the degrees of freedom of changing. Also, we need to understand that there's multiple product lines here, right? So if there's a need to produce one, something more of one, a specific SKU that would deprioritize or al maybe allow that another one is, you know, less of something else. So it's also a balance we need to keep in mind that if there's a surge, a demand surge <clears throat> or a major stock out and something else needs to be produced, well, multiple lines are used for, <clears throat> for multiple SKUs. And so we could actually have a, a downstream negative effect on those products that had to be switched out. Production sites are global for, you know, for many of the generics industry companies. So it's not just a matter of producing the, the, the drug and releasing it, depending on where it is and where it needs to go. There are some delays there as well. Think of number four is all around the product complexity, right? Sterile's, for example, more complex, more steps, more things needed, which can also increase lead times. Demand uncertainty, you know, we heard from, from Priya, there's a lot of things that, that can uh, go wrong or un, let's see, un foreseen or unforecasted circumstances that we typically see from the season effect. So influenza like illnesses, the flu and uh, acute respiratory infections that can cause these secondary bacterial infections. So any negative impact, and that's where I end. Number six, if a supplier gets stocked out, it puts obviously an extra burden on the entire genetics industry as a whole that needs to react, which ultimately could affect our patients in terms of the, the excess treatments that they need. So, so I will stop here because I know we're, we're, we have a time limit and I'll pass to, to Adrian to let us know a little bit more about the, the issues, the challenges and some solutions. So Adrian, please over to you. Great, so I hope 
that everybody can see slide number eight. This is where we, we are right now. So I'll just talk a little bit more about uh, what Bo was, was mentioning, uh, Ray was mentioning. So most of the generic of the medicines for antibiotics are coming from the generic industry. So uh, the generic industry is actually nine out of 10 of the critical medicines list. And on the critical medicines list of the European Union, you have 16% of those are antibiotics. So important share. Uh, of this and, and the generic share of the antibiotic market is about 85% in volume, uh, not in value. So one of the things that a lot of people don't focus on is the generic medicines market. So a lot of people focus on the pharmaceutical market and they're concerned about the high price of, of I don't know, uh, innovative oncology drugs or various things like this. Uh, but there's another side to the market, which is the generic market. And these tend to be very, very low priced uh, medicines. Um, and in fact, in the European Union today, the prices have become so low that in certain circumstances, the sustainability of supply is threatened. And this is kind of explained on this graph. So on the one hand, we have an inflation of cost and an inflation of cost largely related to regulation, actually, but also maybe to energy costs, this kind of thing. And on the other side, we have in Europe capped pricing, which means the prices of generics are set something called a reference price. And those prices in most circumstances cannot increase, so they will stay frozen uh, forever. Um, and what this leads to effectively is the withdrawal of some generic manufacturers over time and a consolidation of the market. As the market becomes consolidated, because there are there can be manufacturing or quality related problems on the generic side as there is on the originator side this leads to a risk of of shortages uh, on the market as explained by my sandos colleagues earlier so this information that we're stating is not only let's say a kind of complaint from medicines for europe it's statistically demonstrated so what you can see here is a graph put together by another company, Teva, but using IQVIA data. And what you can see is that over the five-year period, 2016-2021, the generic incre uh, sector increased its volume, so supplied a volume increase of 27%. At the same time, our prices went down by 41% or our, our value in the market went down. So what this means is that our prices are going down while our volumes are going up. So the unit price of medicines, of generic medicines is effectively going down. And this is driving a lot of consolidation uh, in the sector. Um, so what does this mean then for antibiotic markets? Well, it's actually fantastic for low prices. So it means that health insurers get a fantastic deal, um, which is good because that's important for you know maintaining the sustainability of healthcare systems. But it's gotten to a point, especially actually for antibiotics, where now the sustainability of supply is affected by this. So I have a, an advert from our French member which shows that a cup of coffee in France is more expensive than a pediatric or ger geriatric form of antibiotic. Um, we also have had a lot of issues with, with strained supply chains. Uh, but another factor, which is also very, very worrying, if you take the WHO access uh, list of antibiotics, you can see that the access is actually going down. So the gap in access between Eastern Europe and Western Europe is actually increasing over time there, which shows that uh, you know, there's a, an access problem with mostly generic access uh, antibiotics, largely in Eastern Europe. European countries. I mentioned that issue of the fixed pricing um, in Europe, and uh, here's an example of that. So in, in Spain, the pediatric form of amoxicillin was set at 98 cents uh, in 2003, for, admittedly for 60 milliliter bottle. But in 2013, that is this was the same price applied for a 40 milliliter bottle. So that's a, a 10 year difference where you see effectively the price has been frozen. Um, uh, in Germany, not only uh, the prices have not only been frozen, they've actually decreased by 50% um, over about a 10-year period. So the prices are actually going down in Germany, and this is leading to this consolidation. What does this mean practically for antibiotics? 
So what we're seeing is a consolidation of the market with antibiotic drugs uh, being withdrawn from certain markets. Now, I need to put a caveat here. There could be other reasons why these drugs are withdrawn. Maybe they're no longer prescribed. Maybe there is a safety reason or other reason why they're prescribed. But there's also an economic reason why many of these antibiotics are being withdrawn. Here you see from Poland, from Spain and from France. Um, yeah, this is another data point that we have. You can see here uh, that uh, in Europe, uh, most of the generic medicines actually only have a limited number of supplier uh, per member state. And it's actually worse for antibiotics. So the, the ratio here is, uh, is even worse for antibiotics. I think it's, uh, it, it's probably uh, around 75% or something like that. But we have it in a study if you want to see that. Now, why does this matter? It's because there has been a uh, very clear uh, now statistical link or causation, let's say, established between shortages in Europe and the low supplier count. So this is from an IQVS study where they've shown that two thirds of shortages are associated with generic medicines that have a limited number of suppliers, so uh, less than five. Uh, or in, in, in about 25% of cases, it's less than three. So you can see there's now a link, let's say demonstrated at least by IQVIA, which reviews all shortage data by member states as well as their own uh, database. So this is kind of like a call for action from Medicines for Europe to see how we can improve uh, the situation to reduce the shortages. So Europe, uh, although we are one single market in terms of uh, legal regulation, in practice, we are uh, 27, or if you include the EEA, uh, 30 markets across the European Union, all with very different requirements, which requires, creates a lot of complexity. Uh, for the generic industry, in particular for, for anti antibiotics. Um, and this has a cost. So this increases the cost of maintaining uh, products on the market and makes it more complex uh, to manage. So we would like to see a lot of streamlining where possible around issues like packaging and label, using more uh, digital uh, product information instead of the paper form, uh, et cetera. We also think we should facilitate the movement of medicines across Europe, so to enable uh, manufacturers to have the same rights as parallel traders when it comes to uh, reallocating medicines. If we over allocate for Germany, but we under allocate, say, for Belgium, would it not be simple to to try and reallocate some of that stock uh, towards Belgium, for example? Um, we also think we need to change procurement and pricing uh, rules to include security of supply criteria into that. Uh, so this is done sometimes for vaccines, but very, very rarely uh, for uh, generic medicines. Uh, and we believe it's important because if you don't supply, uh, if you don't reward supply resilience, you're not going to get it into the market. If you only reward lowest price, uh, that's what you're going to deliver. And this is just a little bit more detail. This is a bit technical, but these are some of the proposals we have on how to reform uh, generic pricing markets, um, which are quite specific, which are very different to the pricing markets for innovative drugs. Uh, and so therefore uh, they should, the, the reform policies, if you wish, would be uh, different as well. And we have a similar uh, proposal for uh, procurement reforms. Uh, the Commission is actually working on this issue now and will come up with a guidance on this. A last thing I just wanted to show um, is, you know, one of the things we have a question mark about and, and Priya uh, was mentioning that, you know, one of the, the big things is how early can we detect major changes in the market? So right now, uh, generally they're detected, unfortunately, quite late. Um, but we could make better use of data in the European Union to try and detect shortages earlier. So uh, together with FPA, Medicines for Europe has done a study using uh, EMVS data. This is anti-counterfeiting system data to look at a product which was in shortage um, basically in the period 22-23. And uh, we looked at the 11 or so molecules. This is one. I'm not allowed to tell you which one because this data is uh, confidential information. But nevertheless, it gives you a good example. So what you can see in the, the left-hand graph with the green is if we had used the data from the EMVS, we could have predicted the risk of a shortage. So not necessarily a shortage. The risk of a shortage uh, significantly earlier 
than the graph on the right, which is the red bars, which was when the official declarations of shortages were announced in Europe for this molecule. So you could see here, now this was uh, happened to be a major European-wide shortage, shortage, okay, which is not something that happens every day. Uh, it's, 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 it's not a, a daily occurrence. Uh, but this was, so this was a major, major shortage. But nevertheless, it shows you that if we had used data, which currently we're not allowed to use, um, you know, we could have much more predictive. This would not have solved everything because there would have still been a lag in the supply chain, but obviously we could have gained a couple of months here, which would have been material for uh, physicians, patients, pharmacists, uh, hospitals, whoever was uh, affected by this shortage. So it's just to give this indication, you know, the even basic things that we could do in Europe, uh, we unfortunately don't do them. So I'm going to stop there. It was a bit of a long presentation. And uh, we'll be happy to take any questions from anyone to us or to the colleagues. Christine? Thank you. That was excellent. Really, really interesting presentation. So thank you so much. Um, I have two questions. Uh, I'm curious about um, stockpiling because stockpiling has become a, a more common intervention across many European countries and how uh, that impacts um, production cycles and lag times. Uh, so that's the first question. And then the second question, and this maybe this is a, a unique to Norway situation, but um, price increases for unit prices um, for primary care medicines. Um, we have a, a the way our market is structured in, in Norway is that the main private pharmacies are owned by a wholesaler. Um, and so how do you ensure that a price increase actually goes to the producer? Um, uh, so the marketing authorization holder, rather than being absorbed by the private pharmacy or the wholesaler. Thank you so much. OK, so maybe I'll reverse the order of those questions, maybe if, if that's OK. Um, so I think the first one, indeed, if we're looking at policies to increase uh, prices, it's it's good to understand uh, how the market works, uh, because typically in most markets, a certain amount of discount or rebate is going to go to intermediaries. So it may go to the hospital. Uh, if uh, you're selling to a hospital and there most of the time, most of the time our industry is selling directly to hospitals. There are a few exceptions uh, to that, um, but sometimes let's say a price increase could be absorbed by the hospital without the insurer ever really seeing it or the manufacturer in that case. Um, but most of the time this will have uh, an effect. The, the second one can be in a community market, the, this can be absorbed by wholesalers or by pharmacies. Um, and so indeed it's it's good to have a look and to ensure that somehow the return is going to the manufacturers so that they can reinvest, let's say, into the supply chain because uh, resilience, uh, et cetera, has a cost. Um, so I know uh, this depends a little bit market by market. So for example, in Sweden, the authorities basically have a direct uh, relationship, financial relationship to the manufacturers, whereas in, in Norway and most other markets, it's through the wholesalers. So how you manage this exactly uh, can be a little bit delicate. Uh, I think there, you know, one of the issues is more transparency when you have intermediaries, I think is, is necessary in these cases, which is not easy to achieve. Um, but, uh, but I think that's, that's the way to uh, ensure that. The second question, sorry, was on stockpiling. So what we see across Europe now is a trend of governments putting regulatory mandated stockpiling. So you have a regulatory obligation to have a certain amount of stock, three months, four months. In Germany, it's six months of stock. And so you have to uh, basically hold this stock only for that market um, or you will get a regulatory fine and a significant regulatory fine, like uh, possibly higher than the commercial value of the product. So um, this is the trend that we see across Europe, and we consider it to be highly problematic. Um, first of all, because this is not paid for, so the manufacturers have to pay for it. If they have production in the country, they may have warehouse space, so they may 
somehow be able to absorb this at some lower cost. But if they don't, they have to rent the warehouse space from a wholesaler. It has to be, of course, GDP compliant. Um, the second factor uh, with this is that that stock is reserved for the member states. So the six months of stock that we will soon have to hold for Germany can only be for Germany. It cannot be for Norway or Sweden or Belgium or anybody else. And that's going to basically block you know, certain solutions because nine out of 10 shortages are actually localized in one or two markets, not European wide. So this idea of reallocating makes a lot of uh, common sense, but that will not be possible. It's also certainly not possible in France where they have four month stock, because if you would do that in France, you get a massive, massive fine. And our members just got a fine last week. Uh, the total com cumulative fines were 8 million euros. So it's a, it's material. Um, so so as you can tell, we are very critical of this and we're asking the European Union to look into this because most of these measures are not proportionate um, and they're disruptive to the internal market and to a new notion called EU solidarity, which was something that was introduced in COVID times where member states agreed to help each other rather than hoard uh, medicines um, or, or face masks or whatever else. But I don't know if the Sandoz colleagues want to add any anything on this. Yeah, sure, I can, and Bo, feel free to jump in as well. Um, so just to build on what Adrian said, also, uh, I think some of the uh, questions not so clear or not 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 uh, answered fully are around inventory cost and you know the the holding the warehousing cost, but also then we we do end up with a lot of write-offs because within the shelf life, sometimes the stocks are not utilized and therefore then a lot of wastage as well. And it's, you know, which a stock that could have been used in another country uh, ends up, you know, getting written off. So I think there are bigger challenges here which need to be discussed as well. Uh, uh, and what doesn't help is also that some of our packs are not harmonized, as in we cannot interchange a one country's pack, even if it's the same dosage form and the same strength. We have different packaging and regulatory approvals in different countries, which makes it very challenging to, to use across countries, uh, which is also something we are trying to uh, resolve and really trying to drive forward to have more harmonized packaging because end of the day, the prescribing information is the same and the, the way the product is used in patients is the same. But unfortunately, we have different SKUs and different packaging in different places, which makes it very complex. So do we have any more questions from the group to our speakers? I don't see any hands, but thank you so much for laying out this complex process to us and all the challenges related to it. Um, and I think we're moving on to the next. Oh, OK, here we have Christine again. Go ahead. And I think you're muted. Sorry, uh, just one more question. We had a very interesting presentation last month from the Netherlands um, regarding unit dispensing. In, in the Netherlands, they can um, break up packages um, and wonder if what industry's thoughts are on, on unit dispensing and breaking up packs, um, if you're familiar with what they do there. Yeah, Thank so you. we have some concerns with this. So it's, uh, it's also being done in Belgium, but only for antibiotics, I believe. Um, so this has a few uh, challenges. Um, first and foremost, it's illegal. Um, so because the FMD legislation requires the decommissioning of the pack at dispense to the patient. So therefore, this uh, breaking up of the packs and giving uh, five pills to me and three pills to you, Christine, and, uh, and seven to another is actually uh, not allowed under the EU FMD uh, legislation. So there's, for the Netherlands, there's some kind of bizarre exemption which uh, directly breaks the law. Um, so I say this, uh, obviously the risk of counterfeiting or falsified medicines is extremely low. So I, we acknowledge that. Uh, but, you know, we as an industry have paid 2 billion euros to put in a system to uh, protect patients against counterfeiting. So we don't take lightly to then 
uh, this kind of uh, initiative, uh, let's say, going going forward. So that's from my perspective. I don't know how it is from the manufacturer perspective. There's anything from Sandoz on that? I don't know if you know about this. No. It's when they fully align this, cut the packs in, in little pieces. Fully aligned, Adrian. And again, if for us, it's complexity again. Uh, and as I was saying, we have examples of the same, say, take an example of Amoxiclav 625, which is available in packs of 10s in one country, packs of 14s in another country, packs of 20 in another country. And should we add further variations, it, it just adds to the complexity in manufacturing because each of these then require shift line changes, etc. cetera. Uh, so the more it's harmonized and, and in line with the dosing of the product, it is it is ideal. Yeah. And maybe just to quickly add uh, to what Priya said, I think this is really strengthens the need to follow guidelines. You know, a lot of these antibiotics are, are quite old in the sense they've been on the market for decades. When you actually look, guidelines have evolved. Guidelines have evolved in terms of dosing and strength and time. And <clears throat> so this could also be optimized from the pack sizes as well. Because actually we see if we actually were to take an aggregated form of, let's say, the UK guidelines, um, Sweden, for example, you see a lot of commonalities and you will differences. And so a lot of the pack sizes could indeed be harmonized uh, according to what's actually being needed and, and used. So. Thank you all. And I see that we have some questions for you now from Jean-Baptiste first. Good afternoon and thank you very much for, for this presentation. Um, I would have a, a question, maybe if you could expand a little bit more on how you rely or not rely on the epidemiological assessment and modeling to forecast the demand. And maybe not only in a perspective on uh, forecasting the demand for a new market or in the long term, but for assessing the more short term fluctuation. And, you know, we had this exercise last year uh, to try to address potential shortage of antibiotic use on the respiratory infection during winter. And here there is a lot of uh, epidemiological data and forecasting uh, being used. Sometimes not necessarily to forecast um, proper bacterial infection to be treated by antibiotic, but also forecast just the demand, whether it's a due demand or not for antibiotic. So just would be interesting to know from your side the challenges in this type of uh, approach, uh, what the industry has as tool uh, to rely on this type of uh, input and maybe uh, what is missing in the exchange between public private sector on this uh, aspect. Mm -hmm. Priya, did you want to take that or should I take a crack at it? You, you could. Very good. Yep. Perfect. So, so, so look, uh, as Priya uh, alluded to earlier in the call, I could talk to hours about this, so I won't do that. Otherwise, I think I'll be in trouble. But let me just make some some high level comments. So to your point, Jean Baptiste, rightly so. Obviously, predicting what surges are going to be coming due to epidemiological uh, pathogens and, and uh, trends is very difficult. As a matter of fact, if someone was to crack it completely, it's the holy grail. We see also in the context of a flu vaccine, just the debates on deciding what variants and what mixes are going to go into the vaccine. And it's uh, to, to a larger extent, it's impossible to have 100% accuracy there. Now, in the context of predicting, um, as Brian Adrian mentioned, I mean, the one challenge that that industry has and us as a whole is that you know, if any change is going to be made on the production line, we heard it's not just a matter of pressing a button and changing. You have lead times anywhere, you know, four to six months, even longer, depending on the product, the lines and the complexity. Um, that being said, I think artificial intelligence is our greatest friend. And the most important thing to train a model is, of course, to have the data and what you can do. And also, as you rightly said, there are certain trends and this has to be the predictions always have to be done at country level. Why? Because we heard different prescribing patterns, right? different uses of, of the, 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 the product, and also different trends in terms of the, the epidemiological outbreak or sudden surge in respiratory viruses. Uh, you can have a very different pattern in Poland as you would in France, as you would in Germany, and so forth and so on. Also, I think age demographics is another big factor. Those countries that have a larger proportion of, of children and or, you know, individuals over the age of 65 tend to, in general, have a stronger uh, effect when, when there's a surge in a season. All these things matter. So I think, number one, forecasting this is difficult for manufacturers to have, actually have a response. It needs to be done longer term. Two weeks to two months is not going to um, be good enough, which, of course, adds to the complexity. 
And, and three, we need to rely on good quality data to be able to train those sets because then you have a, a higher accuracy there. And again, I'm more than happy to, to talk offline. This is a very complex topic, but that's hopefully a, a general picture. Thank you. Thank you. So we have one more question and we have to move. I'm a bit mindful of time here because we have another very interesting presentation. So please, Peter, uh, go ahead and maybe we can make the response a bit quick so we, we can move to our next next speakers. Uh, quick question, probably more addressed towards Adrian, but I must hundred percent sure. Um with respect to package opening. I'm hundred percent convinced that it is applied um in the community setting. Does it also apply to hospital pharmacies? Sorry, the decommissioning? No, no, no. Yes, the FMD uh, and uh, yeah. So the decommissioning in the hospital should also be should also be at point of dispense. However, uh, we know that in reality, uh, this doesn't. This isn't always the case because in some hospitals where you have a let's say a kind of central pharmacy for um, more than one department or something like this, the point of dispense would not be the same um, as the the location of the receiving uh, hospital pharmacy. But this is not compliant with the legislation. And just because the commission Q&A says it's possible, this is a deviation, clear deviation from the legislation. I think in the hospital setting, in some ways you can understand the practical sense of this and you can see uh there's uh this i'm not sh i don't see the practical justification for this in the community pharmacy no no community is my question is about hospitals because you know there are a thousand tablet packages or a hundred file packages which would not go directly to one patient so uh it's a bit contradictory if it's licensed it's licensed despite not being within the, the legislation. So it seems to be a bit awkward to me, unless there's a um, derogation for hospital pharmacies allowing uh, opening yeah, of packages. Yeah, this is allowed. This is not what the legislation says, but this is, uh, in practice, this is what uh, certain hospitals do. They have to the, this but, kind of situation. Uh, being against the law, it's a bit uh, paradoxical to me. And yeah. I stop there, because. Yeah, OK. We, I mean, we can take it up offline if you want. Uh, it depends what you consider the point of dispense in the hospital. Also. So maybe we should, um, because just for the recording purposes as well, um, just to state for people who will watch the recording later, that there is um, some uh, discussion about this in the chat. Um, so I think this is this could be a follow up point uh, for us at a, at a later time. Thank you. Sounds good, Christine. And now we have to move on a little bit. So thank you all for this very interesting presentation and very interesting questions. Uh, as well. Um, and now we're moving to uh, our next presentation. And we're very happy to welcome Andreas Assamer and Javier Molins from Access VetMed Europe to take the stage. Um, and feel free to also introduce yourself a bit closer as well and uh, to the group. Thank you so much. Um, th thank you, Sophia. Um, uh, this is Xavier Molins. Uh, I'll, I'll just initiate the, the presentation today and, and again, thanks very much for the opportunity of this working party, working group from, from EU Jan Bright that has given us to, to do that presentation today. I'm also going to be accompanied by uh, my colleague from the board, uh, which is Andreas Assamer. I mean, he can introduce him himself. He's the general manager of Pet Viva Richter in, uh, based in Austria. And, uh, and in case of myself, I'm um, the head of regulatory affairs now for Pymida Animal Health Limited, which is a company based in, in Ireland. But I'm here also like in representation of Access Web Med, where I'm currently holding the position of chair. And I also, or we also have here the presence of Elsa Vecina, which is the technical director, which I would also like to thank you for all the all the help that he, uh, she has given us in, in relation to all the compilation and preparation of all these slides. 
Uh, and also, just before I start, if you allow me only like 10 seconds, uh, also apologies to Elsa because I should be using a background in my video, which is not the one that I'm using today. But based on the event that we had yesterday night, I was, I, I was really, I had to show you like those images that I, I guess that most of the people in Europe was was able to enjoy yesterday night. Okay, um, so uh, just going to the next slide, please. Or if you or you want me to, oh yeah, that's fine, very good. So uh, just to give you like a bit of a background of our association, uh, we were founded in 2022 as the European Group of, for Generic Veterinary Products, uh, which was called the ECBP. Uh, now this name was a bit, sometimes it was creating a bit of fun, a bit of controversy. So around four or five years ago, we did a full rebranding and, and reshaping of our association, the vision, mission, and we ended just changing the name of our organization to what it is now at the moment, which is Access Red Med. And essentially what we do is we represent uh, the generic and other body of veterinary medicines industry in Europe. And as you can see, our main vision, it's quite linked to the name, which is basically to increase access. And, and access, when we mean by access, we talk about availability, compliance, convenience, efficacy, safety, and savings of the veterinary medicinal products, both to veterinarians and also to farm and companion animal owners across Europe. And on the left side of the slide, you have some numbers of of, of, of what we represent. At the moment, we have like 27 members across our Europe, uh, counting for uh, around 9,000 employees. And our total turnover is uh, 2.4 billion euros. And we currently hold our association like 45% of all the generic uh, veterinary products that are currently authorized in, in Europe. I know probably that figure might be a bit uh, kind of misleading. Um, essentially, it's because in the European market, we have a lot of well, the other half of the products they are just spread into a whole bunch of different companies that they only hold a small number of, of registrations. But in our case, the 27 members, there's a significant number of those members that have between 300 up to 500 licenses in Europe, or in some of the cases, actually more than that. Uh, we'll go to the next slide, please. OK, um, so just to give a bit also more background about the issue that we're talking to, um, today, uh, we felt it was important just to give you some some understanding or idea of the differences between veterinary and, and human medicines. So obviously, in terms of targeted species, on the human side, you are only talking about one species. When normally, in our case, uh, we are talking about seven major species plus a whole bunch of uh, minor species. In terms of the market size, I mean, we are very uh, Undermined here because obviously the human uh, the human side just represent 97 percent of the total market size, when in our case it's only like three percent. Now, as uh, some of my colleagues from from the human side were just saying before, one of the issues or one of the hurdles that they might potentially experience is the fact that there's also like the social security, the health systems, when in our case uh, it's 100 percent private. In relation to the portfolio, uh, one of the things that we noted is that our market is less specialized. We have many registrations, but they have to cover like different therapeutic groups. So that's one of the characteristics of, of the of the animal veterinary medicinal products. And in terms of uh, consumer and environmental safety, one of the challenges that we currently face is that we have also like a stringent regulatory requirements to guarantee or to ensure like the food and environmental safety for all the products that we put into the market. Uh, by by food, I'm talking about the, the, to ensure that um, that when the animals, obviously, some of the animals might enter into the food chain, so we need to guarantee that once they are treated with our products and they go into the slaughter, uh, they have levels in in the meat which are below the ones permitted um, by the competent authorities. And in relation to environmental safety, it is also acknowledged that uh, that's also like part of the of the dossiers of the information that the human side have to present. But uh, the level of information that we have to present in, in on the animal health is, is actually quite quite significant in, in comparison. So uh, over all those four threads, they lead us into the conclusions that you see below in the slide in yellow, which essentially we are in a market which is with lower margins. There's like fierce competition, and there's also like a higher burden, both financially and complexity in terms of like regulation, just to keep those those licenses that we have in Europe alive. Go to the next slide. Um, also to put you in context, um, 
we we have just generated that data from the from a new database which is available now for veterinarian products in Europe, which is called the UPD, the Unit Product Database. Um, so from that data, we have extracted that there's around eleven thousand registrations across Europe for veterinary anti-infectives uh, for systemic use, and from those, there is a sixty percent that they are generics. Uh, we have focused this slide on anti-infectives because that's the majority of the of the anti-infectives that are registered in in Europe. But just for information, if we had to add the other antibiotics which are used for local use, for instance, in traumaries or other ones that are used uh, dermally, uh, they account for another uh, 1500 uh, licenses. But the vast majority will be like for, for systemic use. And in the pie that you can see in the lower end of the slide, that shows you the split of the genetic licenses that we have now classified depending on the type of antibiotic. So as you can see, I will say that the two thirds of that corresponds to the beta lactams, uh, followed by the macrolides and then the quinolones. So that will account for like two thirds of, of the whole generic antibiotics currently authorized in Europe. We go to the next slide, please. OK, um, so just before we go into the specific topics and then I'll handle the floor to Andreas in terms of like shortage versus availability. Uh, the major problems that, that we know that have been identified by veterinarians are two. One will be the therapeutic gaps, which is the fact that there are, there's a lack of unauthorized medicines in a specific market for a specific disease and a specific species. And also the fact that the medicines might not be authorized, or sorry, might be authorized in the market, but actually they are not marketed because it's not really financially viable for, for the company. So uh, the consequence of those is that basically in that particular market, the use of the BMPs will be triggered by what we call like the cascade. So if a person uh, in theory, well, like a veterinarian has to prescribe a, a particular product, but that product is not available, they will use the cascade to, to go into the next available product. Or um, a lot of the times what we see is that then in a particular market, what uh, the veterinarian might just require is like a special importation license to bring a product from either another part of Europe or from outside of the EU. And then one of the new uh, trends that we have seen, especially in the last few years since the new regulation 2019-6 came into effect, is the use of parallel trading. Go to the next slide. OK, so here we start with the, the different subsections that, that we have split. So I'm, I'm going to cover the first section, which is in relation to the, the active substances, what we call APIs. So um, in line to what uh, Bo was saying before on the human side, uh, our companies, they source directly a lot of the products from outside of Europe. And if we have to specifically target a, a market, that will be like China, essentially, and, and India. Um, in overall terms, I mean, that will represent about 90% of our API sources. Um, the, the feedback that we normally get from our associates is that basically sourcing from EU is not really like an option. There's a few EU producers, and sometimes, or a lot of the times, they might not be interested to in the animal health market because the prices that they have to offer the APIs are not competitive for us. So again, here's where we get into the whole topic of, of low margins. Um, in terms of lead times, uh, again, they are dependent of the access of the raw materials for these procedures, but they could be, uh, fortunately, they are a bit, a bit uh, lower in comparison to what I could see now from, from our colleagues on the human side, but they could be usually around four to six months, but that will be the, the lead time, so it's not the whole supply chain process. But um, again, those times could be affected and could be directly impacted by other factors, and especially now with all these different wars and conflicts that there are in, in Europe or in the or in the east of Europe, uh, they could be like changed uh, due to all these geopolitical factors. So they could be affected. So those timelines, those timelines could be affected, and then we need to take those into consideration. Um, one of the other factors that, uh, in uh, against to what Priya was saying on the human side, uh, yeah, we know that on the human side, you can just coordinate the supply chains on the forecast based on the season. In our case, we don't experience that issue. I mean, we definitely need like the products all the year around. We we acknowledge that for certain diseases and certain markets, yeah, there could be that seasonability problem. But in general, um, we we don't face that 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 seasonability effect. 
Um, in terms of a stockpiling, uh, what we have seen is that there's been a mild increase in in, in our companies increasing or um, or, or or trying to use it as stockpiling pra uh, practice, especially in comparison to the pre-COVID era. Um, as far as I know, because I was a bit shocked of, 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 of hearing as well, Adrian mentioning this regulation on the human side, uh, and probably Andres might be able to confirm, but I'm not aware that there could be like the similar regulation for us in terms of like forcing companies to do the stockpiling. But that's something that definitely we have seen as a trend now in, in our associates. And especially we do that for uh, APIs that could uh, allow to do that because they have a longer shelf life or because we expect that they could be like vulnerable in terms of like a shortage in the future for whatever reason. And go to the next slide, which is the final one on my end. So uh, essentially in, in summary, uh, we have that supply dependency from third countries. There's very few markets and suppliers that we can go uh, at the moment. Um, the animal health industry, as you have seen, is like a smaller in comparison to the human one, and obviously the generic is even a smaller, although still is a significant uh, percentage in comparison to the innovators. Um, now, the supplier's preference in relation to APIs is to go for, for human instead of use, because obviously the volumes are bigger, and because the margins are higher, they can offer their prices of the APIs at a higher price when this is something that, in our case, being on the animal sector and being on the genetic, we have very little room to play around. Uh, strictly on the regulatory side, uh, we are facing all these barriers and costs. Um, so for us, the addition of a change of a new supplier, a new active ingredient supplier, comes to a, to a high or relatively high cost. When you consider like the cost for in terms of like doing all the qualifications, vendor assessments, the GMP audits that we have to perform, all the maintenance during the life cycle, regulatory variations and so on, sometimes it's not really like, it cannot justify the change. Um, due to the price of the API or because again, the sales of the product are, are too small. So that essentially is translated to the fact that in most of the cases, uh, the animal health uh, generic industry will normally rely on just one supplier or potentially in two in those cases where we could know that the product is quite critical for the whole business or because there's some some vulnerability in terms of like a potential issues that could could happen in, in, in that register API. And that's uh, the end of my part. So I'll handle the floor to Andreas and we'll then open the floor for any questions. So you might have. Thanks, uh, Xavier. Uh, good afternoon to everyone. Yeah, I want to take up uh, what you mentioned uh, regarding the uh, stockpiling. I think the difference is really that when we talk about stockpiling, it's uh, uh, the manufacturers that are trying to to stockpile APIs in order to uh, you know uh, counteract any any disruption of the supply chains and so on. This is at least what we in our industry or we in our company saw during uh, COVID, but there are no regulations whatsoever uh, so far for stockpiling uh, on a national level or something like that. But I, I know that from Austria, where we are located, that the that the uh, government also introduced, uh, I think, a three months mandatory stock for the human uh, companies. And um, uh, we we don't we don't experience that on the on the veterinary side. We also don't have this uh, uh, reporting on stockout situations uh, in most of the countries. I think it's just in in Belgium that's happening so far. Uh, and and I would also I would also say that in general on the veterinary side we don't have that amount of data uh, that the human pharmaceutical industry has, like with IQVIA and other sources. Uh, we have, however, IQVIA in I think one country, if I'm not uh, not mistaken. Uh, there are different companies in different countries, and then there are a number of countries. Mm -hmm. Uh, that uh, do not have any data on sales of of the various medicines uh, available. So therefore, for us, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, forecasting and so on happens really based on demand of uh, of the respective markets or or intermediaries uh, and so on. Yeah, if I look to uh, please uh, maybe to to my slide, if I look to that point, uh, livestock versus companion animals, we're coming to to one of the the differentiating points. We have a lot more different uh, target uh, 
let's say, uh, species, yeah, as we call it, uh, and uh, different animals and even different breeds in, the, in each animal. So that uh, can get relatively uh, complex in terms of uh, dosages and, and, and uh, therapeutic regimes. So basically the big differentiation here is, is livestock and uh, companion animals. Uh, so if I if I take the veterinary industry uh, as such, we don't see big differences in terms of the use of antibiotics because sources and uh, manufacturers are the same as, as on the human side. But uh, there are some differences when we look at livestock, so farm animals, um, then uh, we see that the volumes there are bigger. I think this is also the area of uh, concern and, and discussion over the last years when it comes to uh, antimicrobial resistances. Uh, we have quite narrow price margins there and we are, uh, this is, it is the bigger volume compared to uh, companion animals, but still when we compare it with uh, human medicines, uh, we are uh, by far much smaller in terms of, uh, of, uh, of, of, of the um, yeah, access to the products or or of of relevance for our suppliers. Uh, we also have restrictions for the antibiotic use uh, driven by our legislation. I will come to that uh, on a later slide. Yeah. Uh, when we look at companion animals, uh, restrict some restrictions are not the same as it as these. Uh, of course, this antibiotic use does not go into the human food chain. Um, but uh, we have, of course, also the need uh, to apply antibiotics for cats and dogs and so on. Uh, these are mainly oral products. Uh, quantities are uh, much lower than uh, on the livestock side. Um, uh, but we also need to, to, to be clear that uh, we have uh, uh, due also to GMP regulations and so on, especially with Annex 1, there are issues with uh, or, or, yeah, or requ requirements with uh, regards to cross-contamination. Uh, for instance, when we take beta lactams and so on, and that's that's very important uh, to to keep that. But it also means you have separate manufacturing lines uh, that are required, uh, despite the very low volumes, uh, especially on the companion animal side. Therefore, you know, lead times are longer because you know the manufacturers are, are having campaigns uh, or running campaigns uh, just when they have enough uh, orders uh, on hand, and uh, that of course uh, can delay in terms of a lead time yeah. and uh, yeah uh, in general there are stringent requirements as i mentioned already with gmp annex one that uh, is is uh, is driving us these days um i think in the in the preparation we also had this question is if there is an overuse of pediatric antibiotics in pets uh, we don't know at all uh it's it's not observed or reported uh in in our organization and um it's uh, this. This is is something where you know when it comes to a shortage, as uh, Xavier uh, uh, mentioned before, then uh, the cascade says that we first go for an antibiotic for a different other animal species. If we don't have that, we we should look at imports, uh, and then uh, at at the later stage uh, look at human products. But then uh, certainly we would not go to to pediatric uh, antibiotics. Um, Next uh, slide, please. Yeah, if you look at the regulatory compliance uh, and 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 the regulatory situation, um, then uh, it is it is necessary or or let's say it is an issue that uh, we need certain uh, flexibilities for veterinary medicinal products uh, uh, because the, the the sector is relatively complex and 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 small structured in terms of products and and so on, and uh, uh, we we also are sure that the requirements are not the same uh, than on the human uh, side and, and need to be tailored to veterinary medicine. Some things have happened here already, and I will come to the regulation uh, 2196 that we see here on the on the on the last line of this slide. Um, that is already a, a specific regulation, EU re regulation being valid in all member states uh, for now since uh, January 22, and I'll 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 show in a in uh, one of the next slides uh, what that uh, means. But it, the point is that we have to balance um, between compliance and economics. And uh, this is an, an increasing uh, challenge uh, as uh, really um, uh, the impact on, uh, on the compliance uh, for such a small structure products is something that uh, leads more and more to, to products that are delisted uh, due to the, to the, to the high uh, burden. Yeah, next slide, please. 
Um, yeah, for suppliers, uh, we also believe that uh, there could be more flexibility and a more simple approach uh, for the approval of new suppliers uh, in terms of uh, the addition of a new supplier in, into a dossier uh, or a, a supplier that has already been approved uh, in EU by other uh, uh, EU uh, marketing organization holders. Uh, or if there is a change of suppliers, we have uh, quite a quite some variation fees uh, that are you know for instance uh, prohibiting that we have uh, two or even three we're not thinking about three uh, api suppliers in one uh, dossier for a finished uh, product very often we we are able to maintain one supplier which puts us in a much weaker uh, uh, bargaining situation towards our suppliers if they know that they are the only one supplying for a certain product uh, and that is uh, is is you due to the cost for maintaining this uh, this uh, supplier in the in the dossier, and then also uh, it would be good if we would see more pragmatism in in supplier audits. Uh, we had situations where members of us uh, uh, they had purchased an API and uh, be prior to expiry of a sub supplier audit, but they were not allowed to use that uh, API anymore. Uh, unless they have um, re-audited that uh, supplier. This is uh, something where we would would uh, see uh, some need for more pragmatism. Yeah. So in, in general, the animal health sector, we have more diverse portfolios, a lot of products, many target species, makes it a very small, small business. Yeah. And, um, and uh, the procedures, uh, if compared to human medicines, therefore are more more complex and uh, when we consider the return of investment, uh, it is it is becoming a challenge. <laughs> yeah, next slide, we are looking at the at the new regulation. So uh, basically uh, when th this was a project uh, in the European Union started, if I'm not wrong, in 2009, drafting a new, uh, a really a, a, a harmonized regulation in the European Union uh, coming from all the national uh, laws, uh, being uh, basically on national laws under the human uh, uh, medicinal uh, 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 regulation and uh, and uh, uh, really the, this process took 10 years in 2019 uh, that regulation was published and um, uh, validity or implementation acts and everything were set then for uh, an implementation date in January 22 and hopes were were quite high and uh, one of the main targets was really to um, reduce burden as we see here on the left upper corner um, to simplify processes uh, of variations, uh, pharmacovigilance activities, reduce requirements for environmental risk assessment, risk assessments, uh, and uh, uh, and and for other uh, full in-depth assessments. Uh, so, what we see is unfortunately the contrary. Uh, the administrative burden has increased. So, uh, especially on pharmacovigilance, we see uh, uh, huge increases here. Uh, in terms of what to report, how to report, uh, there are uh, what we see in the in the lower left corner. Um, uh, sorry, please uh, go back. Uh, in the lower left corner, there's this improve of improving a function of the internal market due to databases like the Union Product Database uh, that uh, Xavier has mentioned before, and uh, uh, that is uh, yeah has taken time until it was uh, really ready. Now it's a good tool to have an overview. Of what's registered um, and uh, sales data are reported there, uh, and and so on. So things are, let's say, more centralized. Uh, to, uh, trying to make them more transparent on EU level, but also it's a lot of um, uh, feeding that database, a lot of work to do. Um, there should be simplified rules for packaging and labeling, uh, leading to the fact that uh, the whole. Uh, Let's say structure of 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 an of an a leaflet package leaflet and of the packaging is is totally changed uh, by basically moving all the paragraphs and uh, adding a lot of work uh, for the next few years because the timeline is quite short. So the industry is now in the middle of uh, changing all the packaging materials, uh, which is a lot of cost for maintaining the status quo and uh, and not for any further development of new products or so. And then um, uh, SP SPC harmonization, that's just something that's about to start to harmonize uh, the summary of product characteristics uh, for for the same generics with the same uh, API, same route of administration and so on. So this is uh, what is just about to start. So the, the, 
the administrative work uh, for maintenance maintenance of, of products going on. Yeah, and then on the, on the right side, we see uh, stimulate competitiveness and innovation and so on. Um, increased periods of data protection for original products. That is also something where it is becoming more challenging for generics. Uh, um, and then uh, and then there are uh, a number of 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 other. Uh, things that should uh, improve competitiveness is not yet sure. I think that sound and 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 to increase innovation, that's something that we need to observe because uh, it's relatively short now uh, the experience with this regulation. So we we will be able just in a few years to say uh, did it really stimulate? Yeah. And then on the lower right corner, that's probably the most interesting one. Address the public health risk of anti uh, antimicrobials, uh, antimicrobial resistances. Here, um, it's really that now. All EU countries have to do record and, and, and uh, sales and use data. So this means the industry has to report, but also veterinarians have to report um, for livestock uh, on farm level, uh, which and what amount of, of, of substance they have uh, dispensed and applied. And um, that's a good thing for a more prudent use of, of antibiotics, uh, definitely. Um, also, the prophylactic use is, is basically prohibited. There are a few exceptions, but this is basically also something that has been introduced. And then also the restriction of, of, of really critical, critically important uh, human antibiotics uh, is also uh, getting stricter. We see it just these days that uh, uh, really, some some countries, and also we see UK, for instance, is following this uh, 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 this tendency. So there is uh, a focus on it, and and even some countries, uh, because it's always allowed to be stricter. Some countries have tried to be even stricter here. But it's a it's a Europe wide regulation. That's the good point here. Um, but uh, if you look on the next slide, uh, we can see what uh, what does it mean for the for us for marketing authorization holders. Uh, for the member companies of Access VetMed. So we've done a, a survey uh, among our members. Uh, so we are 27 members. We got uh, 16 uh, 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 replies here, and they all uh, give a very clear picture. So if we look on the left graph, we see the uh, evolution of uh, human uh, resources in a regulatory and pharmacovigilance departments. And if we see the level in 21 and then compare it to 22 and 23, uh, there is a huge increase that is uh, easily easily seen. Uh, in relative terms uh, for pharmacovigilance, it's even, even stronger, even higher growth here. And then on the right side, it's uh, really the budgets um, that are uh, applied for variations for other regulatory fees or or other fees or and uh, pharmacovigilance budget also that is the one growing together with the variations in the strongest way and as a reference uh, the the curve that is the the lowest one is the inflation rate in eu and we all know uh, under what stress uh, the whole european union or some countries even more have been the last years or still are with high inflation rates but that's nothing compared to the increasing budgets that we have here on regulatory and pharmacovigilance side yeah, next one, please. So, and then I'm already almost uh, uh, on uh, coming to the final remarks. So, the two more slides. So, yeah, we see here a highly complex uh, regulatory environment uh, that is adding a significant pressure on the animal health industry and that has just started. So, the final consequences are not yet uh, clear. Um, but we see really the risk of, of, uh, of serious availability issues uh, for old or critical antimicrobials. Old means also that uh, normally dossiers and registrations are maybe not that, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, on, on, a, on a status in terms of, uh, of, 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 comp uh, of completeness or as a new newly registered product will be. And everything, every old product that you have to touch is then... Uh, uh, connected with a lot more costs to upgrade that, and uh, then very often uh, uh, it it is maybe does maybe not make sense to to maintain that. So it uh, this is really uh, uh, an issue that we see, and uh, yeah, and if we put these antibiotics at risk, uh, it would have uh, also a negative impact on the resistance situation uh, if we don't have possibilities to treat, and if um, uh, really the use of antibiotics is even more. Uh, restricted, uh, as we see it with the new regulation, um, then it could lead that, uh, and if national registrations are even stricter here, and there were some 
uh, drafts in some member states that were going extremely wide uh, so that, for instance, for each treatment, um, you have to do an, an antibiogram uh, before you are allowed to treat uh, for almost all antibiotics. These were some of the drafts. Uh, Fortunately, uh, they, they were not coming into force at the end of the day because uh, you would have to let the animal suffer for a few days until you get the result of this uh, antibiogram. And, uh, and that is something that's definitely not in line with avoiding pain for animals and is definitely an animal welfare issue. We should also uh, uh, respect this uh, here. So last but not least, uh, a call for action is, uh, and we focus here on one point uh, because I, I, I I also see that uh, our colleagues from the human side have mentioned already a lot of a lot of different issues. Uh, we would focus here on one point, and this is really a, a call for action also for a political will will change in a way that uh, during COVID there was uh, a lot of 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 um, uh, PR and willingness expressed um, terms uh, in terms of of of, of building API. Uh, production in Europe and strengthening the European pharmaceutical industry. Unfortunately, nothing or not much has happened since then. It has become relatively silent, and uh, this is this is the, the the key topic that we see here. Um, that there should be incentives uh, to produce APIs inside the European Union, Union just as uh, as uh, Sando has shown and is is currently doing uh, on the penicillin side and. Uh, and really that we uh, ensure also that uh, EU producers are able to supply the EU animal health markets, no matter if big or small companies, uh, uh, that would be something that we as a the small part of the industry would, would ask for. Thanks so much and uh, yeah, we open for questions. Sorry for taking that much time. Christine. Yeah. No, no worries. <laughs> Go ahead, Christine. Thank you. That was that was fascinating. Really, very interesting. Thank you for that excellent presentation. Um, I have uh, two questions oh. regarding the packaging. Um, is there? Do you have multi-country packaging uh, for veterinary antibiotics? Is that something that's been introduced? Um, and then I'm I'm very curious about the European API incentivizing uh, uh, API production in Europe. Hmm. Have you thought about what that might look like? Because obviously unit price is even more um, uh, elastic for um, for medicines that the, the farmers have to pay for themselves or the pet owners. Is there, um, because obviously, you know, if we were going to incentivize that, one would think that the price would go up a bit. Are there other uh, mechanisms that you've been thinking about to uh, bring back um, API production in Europe? Thank you. Uh, yeah, uh, the, the the packaging I think is an is an easy one. Uh, we have multi-country, uh, multilingual packages. Uh, uh, if we have the possibility to do a centralized procedure, then it's even even a bit easier because in terms of harmonization of text. But uh, also uh, uh, we have it for all other procedures. But it's then a question of the amount of text uh, and the size of the pack uh, to do uh, multi-language packaging. But that's the only, in reality, the only way to uh, market the product uh, on the veterinary side. There are only a few where you say, okay, we don't care, single country pack is okay. Uh, but that also offers uh, an easier uh, way of, uh, of doing cross-border trade as well as parallel trades. Uh, yeah, and the other question is, I would say, quite a quite complex one. Yeah, uh, uh, I think bottom line, uh, it's it's really uh, uh, the call for you know what 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 has been what has been announced, what has been promised uh, on uh, uh, during COVID period uh, to also go for uh, for for trying to implement this. Yeah? Uh, we know costs are lower in uh, in in certain countries for APIs, but also if we look to the the total costing on on based on API manufacturer in China, I mean they don't they don't have the same the same uh, costs involved. Uh, of course, labor is cheaper, but also all the environmental or 
regulations that we have in European Union. If we look at uh, all climate regulations and so on, it's not the same that they have to factor in into their cost calculation. So we are buying actually products that are manufactured under different standards. So it is, it is, it is, at least what I have seen in, in the few audits that I have been part uh, with uh, Chinese uh, manufacturers, uh, I had the feeling is, uh, is it is a different level uh, 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 playing field. Yeah. I don't know, Xavier, if you have something to add here. Not on the second part, because it will really fall outside of my expertise, but on, on the first question. I think. I lost the connection now, sorry. I'm back now. now. Can you hear me well? Yes, okay. yes. Okay. No, so I was saying in relation to the packaging, you touched the area of the multi-language. Uh, um, I just wanted to add here, because I'm not so sure if that's what probably Christine might be referring or, or might be information that could be useful to you in relation to the volumes, uh, the volume of the pack sizes that we might commercialize in, in different markets. So that's, that's also part of our feature. So we, we need to be conscious that uh, in, even if now with antimicrobial use, uh, the product has to be given to Axel, the animals are really infected or potentially could get infected because they are in, in, in most of the cases in herds or they are all grouped together. Uh, the, the sizes of the herds across Europe will be not the same. Like if you touch, I mean, if you look into a to a farm in, in the east of Europe or, or sometimes in some of the Nordics, might not be the same size as in other parts of Europe. So that's why we have to play around with the sizes. But in, in most of the cases, the the antibiotics, especially if they are given in injectable, um, they, they will just go in ranges that could go from 20, 50 ml, the smaller size can go up to 500 ml. And the reason why you will do that, well, apart from the, the, the species, that that's another factor. So you could potentially have a larger batch size because if you have a product that can be used for cattle and sheep and the dose is different, so you will normally use the bigger pack size for the cattle if the farmer wants the product for a herd of, of cows or then you will use a smaller pack size for, for sheep or for pigs. But uh, the factor of, depending on the geographical area, the, 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 the type of the bile or the size of the bile that we're going to be commercializing, it's also, it's also definitely a, a factor. Thank you so much, Andreas and Javier, for that very interesting presentation. I think we all learned a lot uh, something new that we can use, you know, in our work going forward. Unfortunately, Adrian, I saw your hand, but uh, I want to be mindful of everyone's time. Uh, it's three o'clock yeah. right now. Uh, and thank you all of the speakers today. It's been very interesting to listening to your presentations. Uh, and thank you for joining our meeting. Uh, as I said in the beginning, we also aimed to have a few updates for the Work Package 9 uh, work. Uh, and the discussion, but we were a bit optimistic on time, so uh, we will have to get back to you all, uh, all the participants via email instead uh, in the beginning of next week, because we wanted to prioritize these uh, discussions and presentations from our, our guests. So uh, thank you again for to all of our speakers. Uh, it's been a pleasure having you to this meeting, and we learned a lot from your presentations. And uh, I think we have to close the meeting now. It's one past three. So have a great weekend, everyone. And thank you again. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye.